Korea, a crowded little finger of land extending out of Asia's mainland, pointing significantly toward Japan and the Pacific beyond. A nation not much larger than our state of Minnesota, but acre for acre, one of the most violently mountainous areas on Earth. Today, the capital city, Seoul, is largely restored, rising from the rubble of almost total destruction to become at least somewhat like her old self. The Capitol building wears a new dome, but nothing short of complete rebuilding will ever erase the battle scars in these walls. As Koreans today know it, the peace is an uneasy armistice in a divided nation. But with the dogged stoicism of a culture 4,000 years old, they go about the business of living, knowing as they do that for the living, there is no other course. In the markets, the scrap pile school of architecture prevails, but business is as colorful, noisy, and aromatic as it ever was. North of Seoul, the mountains rise in sharp volcanic disorder. Green foliage has returned to slopes once blasted bare by TNT and napalm, but at the summits, eyes still keep watch to the north. Along the demilitarized zone, or DMZ, entrenched forces face one another across no man's land. Here, the armistice decreed, the armies would pull back from one another, forming a buffer zone among the mountains. Once again, Korea, the ancient mountain kingdom of Chosen, is in fact the land of the morning calm. But no one forgets June 25th, 1950. It was still dark, four o'clock on a Sunday morning. South Korean villages awoke to a world suddenly filled with noise and flame. The communists, made bold by months of small-scale raiding across the 38th parallel, had finally launched their undeclared all-out war of conquest. Half a world away in Washington, President Truman took immediate action, saying, in these circumstances, I have ordered United States air and sea forces to give the Korean government troops cover and support. Next day, at the United Nations in New York, United States Representative Warren Austin made our position clear beyond doubting. The armed invasion of the Republic of Korea continues. The Republic of Korea has appealed to the United Nations for protection. I am proud to report that the United States is prepared to furnish assistance to the Republic of Korea. Spearheaded by tanks, the Red Forces had moved swiftly. In two days, they were attacking the capital city itself. Seoul fell the next day, June 28th. By June 30th, the Communists had crossed the Han River south of Seoul and fought through the rail city of Yongdongpo. With their heavy Russian-made tanks, they thrust aside South Korean resistance racing down the corridor which led through Anyang toward Suwon. Here the helpless and homeless gathered, only to be told they must flee still farther southward. Everywhere they saw their outnumbered countrymen rushing north to join the battle. Less than a dozen combat planes were available, several of them piloted by Americans. The Korean American Volunteer Group what little you could do with only 10 aircraft, we did. Even as the Red Armor swept toward Suwon, advanced elements of the 24th Infantry Division were being airlifted to Korea from Japan. Their coming was known to the people. 
they were welcomed with cheering. Four days later, they met the enemy south of Osan, and the cheering was forgotten. Man, I was scared. I didn't know it was going to be like that. The enemy was a lot stronger and better trained than we'd heard. Some guys thought we'd have it easy. It didn't work out that way. Retreat. The few heavier weapons covered each withdrawal as best they could. Where they had divisions, we had companies. Pull back, fight, pull back again. Four days and nights, nobody slept. We started with a good many green troops. Now anybody could still pack his gear, he was a veteran. Help was on the way. In Pusan, to the south, more 24th Division troops and equipment were arriving by ship. Not enough, not nearly enough, but it was a start. Generals Walton H. Walker and William Dean had a tough assignment. Undertake the work of several divisions with elements of only one. One day I looked up and there they was. Man, if I said those fresh troops look good, I'd be lying. They were beautiful. Not only just troops, but trucks with more heavy stuff and tanks. We met our first red armor 25 miles north of Tejan. July 13th, Yokota Air Base, Japan. Our first large-scale bombing attack is mounted as more than 50 B-29s take off. The target, one saw, key North Korean port city. We wondered how much ACAC there'd be. There wasn't any at all. slow around one sound tomorrow. As the communists moved south toward Tejan, we pulled back across the Kum River. This natural barrier offered another chance to buy time from the enemy. We took advantage of it. The Air Force was playing a leading role in our attempt to delay the communist advance. Lacking bases in Korea, F-80 jets adapted oversized wing tanks for the long flight across the Sea of Japan. Angel 5 to Dofoot, over. Dofoot to Angel 5, request fire on enemy column due north, your position. Angel 5 to Dofoot, receive your transmission, we'll proceed, over. Dofoot to Angel 5, good luck. the Sea of Japan. A Navy task force approaches the east coast of Korea. Destination, Pohang. Mission, to land the men and machines of the 1st Cavalry Division. The Korean battle line was moving rapidly on all fronts. Only on arrival were the troops informed 
that the landing would be unopposed. The division's 27,000 men started ashore. Psychology says how you're supposed to feel sort of disappointed. You expect to fight and then don't have to. Maybe so. I wasn't disappointed. On July 20th, the Reds reached Tejjah. 24th Division troops led by General Dean were to hold as long as possible. There was something fishy about Tejjah. I mean, they threw in a little artillery and then we waited. Nothing. Nobody. Then wham, they were all over the place. We found out we were surrounded. It was a case of move out fast to stay put for good. As it was, we were gonna have to make a run down a corridor of fire a mile long, which we did. We had bought more time, but Ted John was gone, and with her, General Dean. We traded time for space. Two weeks for the land between Ted John and the Naktong River. From behind the wide, deep waters of the Naktong, we could test our growing strength. We cut the bridges and poured our fire on the opposite banks. Daily communist attacks probed up and down the length of the line, searching for an opening. Daily, we leveled upon those attacks all the firepower at our command. The line held. In the north and eastern sectors, ROK troops had recovered from the first shattering blows they had taken. They would retreat no more. Where tanks are concerned, Korea is no place to have a war. There's only two directions, up the hill and down the hill. And that perpendicular terrain puts armor in a straitjacket. Still, you do what you can. With a little added elevation, a tank's rifle can be darn good artillery. We found a way to get that extra elevation. It worked fine. Early in August, General William Keane received orders to carry out our first large-scale offensive action. The enemy was trying to punch through in the south and capture Pusan. Task Force Keane, composed of General Keane's 25th Division, the 5th RCT, and the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade, was to repel this attack. It was the 6th of August. I remember, because that's my birthday. Also, it's the first time I ever got shot at. I remember thinking to myself, happy birthday, Charlie. The word came down, time to move again. We had to get the high ground, instead of the base of fire. The armor took charge of the low ground. And from the ridge line, sparked by the Marine Brigade, foot soldiers unleashed their fire. Methodical, concentrated, deadly. The Marines, equipped with a heavy bazooka, found it highly effective against Russian-made armor. beyond, Marines and soldiers faced a dirty, dangerous task. To clear the area of red snipers and stragglers. For veterans of the Pacific, the action was painfully familiar. Like the Japanese, a small-bodied North Korean soldier had a talent for hiding behind a bush no larger than you might grow in a window box.
Task Force Keen took its quota of prisoners. Many had shed their uniforms, hoping to escape in the white civilian clothes worn underneath. At close quarters, the enemy lost his fearsomeness. Usually, he was very young. Always, he was glad to be out of the fighting. Task Force Keen had earned a brief moment in which to catch its breath. Busan Harbor, August 29th. The first non-American troops to join the UN forces in Korea arrived from Hong Kong. Two battalions from the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders and the Middlesex Regiment. Tell us the truth, we was happy to reach Korea. The past six months we'd been sweltering in Hong Kong. And it's so blooming hot we were scared to dig a hole for fear we'd bust right through into hell. At least over here, we'd be cool enough so a man could enjoy his blinking tea time. September 1st, an all-out red offensive across the Noctong tightens our circle of defense. The siege of the Pusan perimeter is off. In the Sea of Japan, Task Force 77 carriers speed up their operations. my job to send them out. Every available aircraft, every usable minute of every day. Our enemy had long, vulnerable supply lines now. Without adequate stocks of ammunition and fuel, his strength would fail. With luck, we'd make sure. Within its circle at Pusan, our strength was mounting daily, even as the Red Armies were dissipating their own. Food, ammunition, supplies, all the tools of war were being stockpiled. Our days on the defensive were nearing an end. On September 15, 1950, the UN forces take the offensive. An assault fleet appears off Walmy Island at Incheon Harbor, 150 miles behind enemy lines. It's a daring end-run maneuver, which takes the sleeping enemy completely by surprise. At 06.30 hours, the Marines begin the assault. The naval barrage has cleared the way for them, but this is still a risky operation. Headquarters must gamble on the first try being good. Inchon's violent 30-foot tides leave no time for a second attempt. We had orders to neutralize resistance and do it fast. Dig them out and cover up the holes. It took us 58 minutes to secure the island. With the next tide, more Marines move into the streets of Incheon itself. They meet little resistance, and within hours, the city is secure. The big gamble has paid off. With the surrender of Incheon's modern harbor, the back door to Seoul is opened wide. Simultaneously in the south, the reinforced 8th Army breaks out of its Pusan stronghold, splitting the encircling Red Forces as it thrusts across the Naktong River to begin its drive northward. At Incheon, the 7th Infantry Division swarms ashore to strengthen the UN foothold in the north. Thousands of enemy troops are being trapped in the southwest as the Pusan spearhead races north 
to join up with Inchon forces. On the way to Seoul, we took a good many prisoners, too. But they didn't come easy. United Nations strength is growing in the north. Men and machines, first hundreds, then thousands, flow inland from the sea to join the attack towards Seoul. With each step, however, they meet stiffening resistance as the retreating enemy consolidates his forces. At Busan, still another nation joins the growing UN command as 1,200 men of a crack Philippine regimental combat team come ashore. And at Kimpo Air Base, south of Seoul, men of the 187th Airborne Regiment arrive from Japan to become the first paratroop unit to enter the conflict. This newly recaptured airfield has also become an advanced base for increased air attacks on the enemy's supply and escape routes. As the spearhead from Busan gathers momentum, columns of transport barrel northward against a disheartened enemy. In many towns, the entire populace turns out to shout its welcome. It was like France all over again. Couldn't understand what these people were saying either. Some places, nobody was around to say anything. It's only about 20 miles from Inchon to Seoul, paved highway all the way. But it took us a week of hard fighting to make the trip. Finally, though, our amphibious gear, crammed full of rock and American Marines, started massing up at the Han River across from Seoul. It was time to retake the city. The softening up process got underway. <laughs> River crossing means a full-scale amphibious operation, since the Han, here near its mouth, is well over a mile across. The Reds who had thrown back an earlier night attack were gone, pulled out to dig in among the streets of Seoul itself. The battle for Seoul was rough. 10,000 communist troops garrisoned every building and street junction with orders to fight to the death. A great many did. The shattered city is retaken September 26. During the battle for Seoul, the trap is closing swiftly about Red forces in the southwest. The day after Seoul falls, troops from the 7th and 1st Cavalry Divisions join up just south of Suwon. Two days later, in the battered Capitol building, special ceremonies are held as General MacArthur officially returns the city to Syngman Rhee, President of the Republic of Korea. Now begins a tragic homecoming for the thousands who had fled the city only three months before. You'd look at these people, scratching through the ashes of what used to be their homes, wonder where they got the guts to go on. Still, I guess we'd do the same back home if it came to that. As life begins to take root again in Seoul, 
the UN advance in the eastern sector goes on. On September 30th, rock forces reach the 38th parallel. They cross it the following day. One old guy couldn't keep it straight who was who. Turned out to meet the rock army with North Korean flags. The end of September finds the war back where it started, but the cost has been great. On October 6th, at a UN cemetery between Seoul and Incheon, Major General O.P. Smith, 1st Marine Division Commander, honors Marine dead. Representing the Army is Major General David Barr, 7th Division Commander. Korean troops are honored by Colonel Park In Yip, commanding the Rock 17th Regiment. The silent thanks and admiration of each commander for what his men have given is echoed by the people who owe their freedom to that willing sacrifice. Elsewhere, the conflict goes on without let up. B-29 squadron based in Japan and on Okinawa continue their daily blasting of red industrial and transport centers in the north. For us, it was a funny situation. A commuter's war, somebody called it. You'd eat breakfast with your wife and kids, spend the day over some rail center or factory or harbor, and head back home to sleep in your own bed at night. Funny situation. In the South, refugees are becoming a major problem, with thousands of red soldiers and guerrillas in civilian clothes trying to escape to the North. Each refugee must be individually, time-consumingly screened. To the north, events are moving so rapidly that reinforcing units are hard-pressed to keep pace with the UN advance. On October 9th, Kaesong is taken. This surrender frees the last South Korean city held by the Reds. Then on the east coast, Wonsan. Just two days after the fall of Kaesong, Rock 3rd Division troops seized the port of Wonsan, having marched 287 miles in 20 days to get there. They met little resistance. Next, the Red Capital itself. On October 17th, men of the 1st Cavalry Division worked their way into the outskirts of Pyongyang. In less than 24 hours, the North Korean capital is in United Nations' hands. Logical warfare plays an important role at this stage of the fighting. Using high-powered speakers, Saiwar planes fly ahead of advancing UN troops, booming their message in Korean to the retreating enemy. Safe conduct passes prove highly effective. More than once, whole enemy companies lay down their weapons and wait for our troops to arrive. Two days after Pyongyang falls, our first combat airdrop in Korea gets underway in an attempt to cut off retreating Red forces north of Pyongyang. As at Incheon, the Supreme Commander personally supervises the operation, nearly 2,000 troops making the jump. In a second wave, the heavy equipment arrives, Air Express. Local transportation is pressed into service. Next day, 1,800 reinforcements jump, but the enemy has already fled northward. In the east, 
rock forces continue their headlong charge north from Wonsan to take Hung Nam. Meantime, a Navy task force is waiting off Wonsan. 3,000 enemy mines had to be cleared from beach approaches before the Marine force could come ashore. It was a delay, but we could afford it. The rocks had made us a welcome present, a beach with no enemy guns on it. The whole division came ashore with nothing worse than a few wet feet. The mission now is to press this advantage, continue the attack toward the Alu. Swiftly, the Marine force moves in on red-held villages and towns. And just as swiftly, out the other side. Spirits are high. Three days later, and more than a hundred miles closer to the Alu, the 7th Division makes its landing at Iwan. Ships of every description swarm into shallow water to disgorge 7,000 men and their machines. Their only opposition, the deep loose sand of Iwan's beaches. This far north, winter comes early to Korea. Cold weather uniforms are welcome as the division moves out to rejoin the attack. To the west, Marines are advancing over ground frozen harder every day. News of their approach runs ahead of them as village after village is liberated. North Koreans meet freely and the Christians among them pray openly for the first time since 1945. The shattered communist forces are pulling back into the last corner of this peninsula they had set out to conquer. UN troops follow as fast as the torturous terrain and increasing cold will allow. In the eastern sector, it is difficult even to keep contact with the retreating enemy. In the central sector, however, prisoners taken during a strong red counterattack give warning of potential danger. Many of them wear the quilted uniform of communist China. Meantime, in the northern sea of Japan, winter is giving our offshore forces a taste of things to come. Even routine supply operations are becoming a nightmare of icy wind and pitching decks. We kept our aircraft warmed and ready to take off the minute the weather lifted. But meantime, the Reds would have a lot less trouble moving troops and supplies on Korean roads. We didn't like that thought much. Ashore, the Chinese forces have pulled back, leaving a clear road to the Yalu. The village of Hai San Jin huddles against the banks of the Yalu across from Manchuria. Here, men of the 7th Division set up their outposts. It seems a sorry spot to spend Thanksgiving Eve. But from bases in the south, cargo planes are already taking off setting courses northward across the frozen mile. They carry crates rigged for airdrop and labeled perishable rush. Turkey and the trimmings, courtesy of the U.S. Air Force. All over Korea, mess kits overflow with steaming potatoes, giblet gravy, cranberry sauce, the works. Along the Yalu, everything is quiet. Every man, no matter what his duty for the day, shares in the traditional feast of gratitude. Headquarters feel certain that one more UN offensive will end the fighting in Korea. Actually, a whole new war is ready to begin. Across the Yalu, the decision has been made. Full-scale Chinese intervention is about to bring the second phase of the Korean conflict to an end. Eighth Army's end of the war offensive was launched the day after Thanksgiving in 1950. It started out smoothly, 
But by nightfall of the second day, the UN was facing a new enemy in Korea, and a new war had begun. The Chinese rolled swiftly southward, splitting the Allied line and cutting off Marine and 7th Division troops in the east near the Chosin Reservoir. We took turns sleeping in the daytime. It was too cold at night. I heard later we lost more people from freezing and from enemy action. Even the mortar rounds froze through the casings. The Chinese had an awful lot of people between us and the beach, but the harbor at Hung Nam was our only way out. All our resupply came by air. Without that, we never could have made it. Same goes for the close air support we got from the Marine Air Wing and the Air Force. They fought their way toward the sea through an enemy force which outnumbered them five to one. Pausing only to evacuate wounded by air from Hagaru, they pushed on, reaching safety on December 10th. They found Hung Nam a busy town. Within the harbor's perimeter, heavy weapons worked around the clock, throwing up a curtain of fire through which the enemy divisions dared not pass. Behind the guns, a near miracle of planning, organization, and teamwork was taking place. A massive amphibious landing in reverse In the space of 10 days, more than 100,000 fighting men were evacuated. North Koreans by the tens of thousands flocked to the dock area to plead for evacuation. From this one area, more than 90,000 North Koreans deserted their homes rather than return to the life they had experienced under communism. We were the last to leave. When we were gone, the harbor would be too. We set blocks of TNT and laced hoses filled with jellied explosive all along the waterfront. When we left, the harbor was one big ticking time bomb. The evacuation convoy steamed southward toward the free ports of Pusan and Pohang. Their troops would reland, regroup, and move back to engage the enemy. The military withdrawal by land was orderly as the rest of the 8th Army pulled back once again across the 38th parallel. But for hundreds of thousands of civilians trying desperately to outrun the advancing communists, the journey southward was a nightmare of cold, weariness, and confusion. Old people pulled loads meant for oxen or carried their precious few belongings on their backs. Children who had no part in the causes of war received full measure of its hardships just the same. On December 27th, General Ridgway arrived to replace General Walker, killed in a tragic jeep accident. He was just in time for the enemy's New Year's Eve offensive. Once again, UN troops pulled out of Seoul, blowing the Han River bridges behind them. Inchon, like Hung Nam, was evacuated by sea. Here, too, we took pains to leave nothing behind which the enemy could use. In the south, 
the troops which had been taken off the beach at Hongnam were regrouped and despite bitter weather, took advantage of a welcome opportunity to catch up with themselves. By mid-January, the enemy offensive had bogged down. Using fire-hardened troops, Ridgeway launched a series of short, high-powered thrusts called Operation Killer. The enemy held a huge numerical advantage. Ridgeway was out to eliminate it. Assault units moved up, expecting to meet great strength. They found surprising weakness. Under the pounding raids of Operation Killer, the enemy fell back. Ridgeway pressed the advantage. No rest for the enemy, and not much more for 8th Army. If anybody ever invents a mattress that feels half as good as a patch of frozen ground felt then, you'll make a million dollars. Although destruction of enemy forces remained its prime objective, Operation Killer had evolved into a ground-gaining operation. The way things were going, we couldn't stay outnumbered for long. The word was they were losing 10 men to our one. For six weeks, the seasoned fighters of 8th Army scoured the countryside, inflicting fantastic losses on the retreating Reds. On March 7th, the enemy's main stronghold east of Seoul was smashed. The next step would be Seoul itself. On March 15th, Korean troops entered the city. They found a few old people and children. The communists had fled. Across the full width of the peninsula, the enemy was retreating. Figure this one out. We're chasing them and they're leaving surrender posters behind for us. In April, General James Van Fleet arrived to take over the 8th Army. A canny tactician, he replaced General Ridgway, who had been appointed Supreme Commander when General MacArthur returned to the United States. Within a week of Big Jim's arrival, he was fighting off the Communist Spring Offensive. The Communists concentrated their barrages on the East Central Front, probing for a weak spot into which to pour their tides of humanity. UN forces were needed to slow the enemy's human wave tactics. We had a routine. Hold till the ammo ran out, then pull back and call for an airstrike. weather grounded the Air Force, units north of Seoul were forced back across the Imjin River. Seoul was fortified against the coming second wave of the Red Offensive. Van Fleet was determined not to lose the capital city again. Whoever said the worst part about war is the waiting was right. Still, we didn't have to wait long. Every road, every valley approach had been zeroed in beforehand. The enemy lost thousands of men, breaking through the curtain of fire, then faltered and lost his advantage. As the enemy turned once again to retreat northward, Van Fleet followed with mobile firepower.
By June 2nd, we had recrossed the parallel. The enemy had spent 200,000 men, a third of his entire force, and gained nothing but the knowledge that numbers were not enough. Operation Killer continued without let-up. Within a month, truce feelers materialized into the first meetings at the red-held city of Quezon. World peace hopes soared. The chief UN negotiator was Vice Admiral Turner Joy. His opposite number, North Korea's chain-smoking General Nam Il. Pessimistic correspondents predicted the talks would drag on for as long as six weeks. With the opening of truce negotiations, the line became stabilized. With minor fluctuations, it would remain much the same until the ceasefire. New battle techniques were developed. In the eastern sector, a marine battalion made history by securing a hill in no man's land from the air by helicopter. The first wave landed a shore party which would clear the small landing area needed. In a matter of minutes, the first copter load of aerial cavalry was arriving. Fully equipped, fresh, ready for action. By using copters, the Marines secured commanding high ground within enemy territory without having to fight their way to it. Copters supplied the operation and evacuated troops at its completion, opening the way to a new concept in tactical troop movement. In Kaesong, the truce talks were already bogging down, deadlocked over the issue of a ceasefire line. We didn't like the setup in Kaesong. It was the enemy's home ground, and he knew it. Nam Il used the talks as a propaganda loudspeaker. The so-called neutral area was crawling with armed red soldiers. We broke off the talks. Air Force saber jets ruled the skies. At this point in the fighting, the UN had lost less than 80 aircraft. Verified kills on communist planes numbered 510. On the sea, as in the air, United Nations firepower went virtually unchallenged. Near the end of October 1951, truce talks were resumed at the tiny farming village of Panmunjom. The UN delegates offered a compromise. They would accept the communist proposed ceasefire along the present battle lines if all other problems could be ironed out within 30 days. If not, all bets were off. The war virtually stopped, except for the constant booming of artillery. Winter came, the deadline was passed, the war was on again. The deadlock issue now was the right of prisoners to free choice in the matter of repatriation. Both sides were adamant. Meantime, across the breadth of Korea were fought the bloody hill battles, names not difficult nor pleasant to remember.
wooded slopes were laid bare, pitted almost beyond believing. This war had reverted to the style of 1914, opposing trench lines facing one another, night patrolling and local attacks across the no man's land which lay between. It was costly, but there was no clear way out. The big break came in April 1953 with little switch. Stalin had died in March and Malenkov had taken over. Immediately he launched his worldwide peace offensive and the Chinese agreed unconditionally to General Clark's standing proposal to exchange sick and wounded prisoners. The exchange went smoothly and truce talks were resumed. Encouraged, the world listened for news of the final signing that would mean ceasefire in Korea. It came on July 27, 1953. While the communists signed at Panmunjom, General Clark, in ceremonies at the UN base camp in Munsan, signed six copies of the document which would end the bloodshed. There was excitement, but little rejoicing. We have stopped the shooting. That means much to the fighting men and their families. And it will allow some of the grievous wounds of Korea to heal. Therefore, I am thankful. The task now is to put the ceasefire agreement into full effect and get down to working out an enduring settlement of the Korean problem. I cannot find it in me to exult in this hour. Rather, it is a time for prayer that we may succeed in our difficult endeavor to turn this armistice to the advantage of mankind. In accordance with the truce agreement, the opposing forces now pulled back from one another. The open ground left between was to become the demilitarized zone, or DMZ. Operation Big Switch began on August 5th. Some 13,000 UN prisoners returned, most of them South Korean and American. In Big Switch, communism received a telling blow. Two-thirds of the captured Chinese refused repatriation, and 35,000 North Koreans decided to stay in South Korea. Among the returning Americans was General William Dean, captured in 1950 as he led his 25th division in the defense of Taejon. Today, Korea is still divided, but the conflict was not wasted. It called the Kremlin's bluff in the Far East. It more than restored the violated border and left the Republic of Korea with the strongest free army in the Far East. It is true that the price of existence for this young republic for some time to come will be constant vigilance. In that, Korea and the rest of the free nations are in the same boat.